All right, we're going to get started. It's 12.05. My name is uh, Richard Shelberg. I run uh, OpenStack Services at Mirantis. And uh, with me today on stage is Anna Dipanu here, who is a project manager or program manager at Mirantis, and um, Christian Humner, who is a cloud architect. They'll help me today with the presentation. Before I launch in, it uh, be nice to know who we have in the audience here. And um, so first of all, do we have any OpenStack developers here? A few? All right, how about users of OpenStack or want to use OpenStack? All right, good. How about vendors, product companies? All right, okay, good mix. Of, uh, it should be uh, useful for uh, everybody. So we're here to talk about projects, cloud, cloud projects, and how they go down. And uh, when we look at uh, projects and the customers that we um, work with, we try to put them into this pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid, we have companies that are primarily looking for services. And this can be, you know, in the worst case, EC2, and uh, otherwise Rackspace or Mirantis OpenStack Express, outsourced services primarily. And as we move up uh, into the pyramid a little bit more, there are companies that are looking for product, kind of black box, uh, drop it in, integrate with some of my support systems and bus or business and uh, operational support systems. And uh, further up, we get to companies that are really into open source and um, they do like uh, OpenStack and other open source projects for that matter. And they'll pick components, put something together, but they really like the uh, community and they uh, like uh, staying close to the trunk, et cetera. And then finally at the top, you have the uh, true custom developers. These companies have large development organizations. They'll pick and choose code pieces from here and there and really build their own solution if it's a, we usually call, if it's a stack, we call that a Frankenstack usually in, <laughs> in the office. But anyway, um, as you move up into the pyramid, the complexity and um, customer involvement increases significantly. Another way to look at it is you have the true ninjas at the top and you get the small, medium business at the bottom. Today we'll be talking about the upper part of this pyramid because this is where a lot of the interesting stuff happens and some of the complexities and challenges. All right, to um, uh, go through this, we organized ourselves into three E's. We start with engagement level. Already before the project gets started, we have to do a few things on the engagement side. And then uh, Anadeep will cover execution and um, Christian will cover some of the engineering aspects of these highly complex uh, projects. All right, so the first thing we have to do on the engagement level is to level set with the leadership of the customer. And um, there's an expectation from the leaders who are heavily invested in the effort that we're about to embark on. And they believe cloud can be transformative te technology. They'll have a more agile organization, faster time to market, faster turnaround for the developers, et cetera. And uh, this presents a number of challenges. So for example, the project within the organization will have interfaces to other parts of the organization. These can be, uh, in the worst case, external companies that you have to work with, but uh, uh, oftentimes they're just other departments within the company. And that's a, a challenge because those other organizations are not agile. Um, the experience in agile process is sometimes a challenge. Even though there's a willingness and a desire to do uh, an agile project, um, that is not a substitute for experience. So a lot of times the experience level needs to be brought up uh, overall. And of course, you have to have buy-in from all stakeholders. The primary stakeholders, uh, the ones who took the initiative, they're always they're bought in. But there are other stakeholders. Um, operations teams, networks groups, et cetera, who are impacted by this, and they, we need to get buy-in from them as well. So that takes us to the stakeholders. So from the core stakeholders, their expectation is that they'll be doing an agile project, and so we'll be operating iterations, there will be incremental results that we can see and we can use. Um, this will, of course, drive efficiency, and um, Overall, they want to uh, get a, uh, adopt a more modern approach to project execution. And there are challenges with this as well. So again, the rest of the organization operates in a waterfall model, typically. That's a problem. Um, because of that, and because of the 
increasing speed that you're going to see over time when you go agile, uh, the, the external dependencies tend to lag and you run into problems on, uh, with timelines, etc. There's often also confusion around planning. So in some cases, we run into a situation that, well, it's all agile now. We don't need to plan. It's all in the backlog, right? That's uh, a big mistake. You do need to plan. Uh, so planning is really important. You need to plan often and uh, uh, before you embark on the project. Now, in the on the other side, planning is done elsewhere. So there's a planning team that is doing a lot of the planning and actually it doesn't translate into the uh, project and the agile model that we're doing. So uh, anyway, so we'll get into uh, how we can solve this. On an organizational level, the uh, or expectation is that we're going to create self-sufficiency throughout the organization. Push button IT. I want a server, I can push a button, right? Um, there's going to be a lot of automation now when we're done with this. That's awesome. And you know, we really want Agile to be pervasive throughout the whole company when we're done. These are the expectations organizationally. And uh, of course, this has a number of challenges. There are some existential questions that arise. Some organization or some uh, departments uh, wonder if they have a role to play after we're all done. So that uh, creates some resistance at times. Um, and they can be related to uh, operations where they've traditionally been very hardware focused and they now have to be focused on user experience. So that's a change. Uh, networking, the network topologies for cloud may not be aligned with uh, various security policies or traditional networking, et cetera. Hardware as well. They may have had a, a, a process of acquiring a certain type of hardware and we're now suggesting that you should go with some you know, commodity hardware of some other kind, et cetera. So, all right, so step one is to manage the expectations. We have to organize to manage expectations throughout. Um, with the core stakeholders and elsewhere in the organization. So you have to get the executive level buy-in from day one. This is a transformative um, evolution of your organization and it has to really be um, uh, visible all the way up to the top. Um, you have to identify a project owner from your customer side. This is the um, um, agent of change, if you like. This person should be empowered and be able to really push others to, to get things done. Decide or agree on a minimum viable prod product. This is your first major milestone. This is something that is a, has a tangible, um, useful application for your users. It should have the minimum set of requirements and features um, to be um, uh, able to handle core workloads and, and create value quickly. This is really important. And then remind everybody involved of what that minimum viable product is uh, every day or every week. Uh, plan for gradual organizational changes. You don't need to change your whole company on day one. You can sort of draw different or, uh, parts of the organization in incrementally as you iterate through the project and milestones for that matter. Um, <coughs> Identify external stakeholders all the time. There are going to be other <coughs> stakeholders later in the project as opposed to in the beginning. Pull them in, get commitment. Uh, and identify and communicate risks. Always assess risks, not just in the beginning, but throughout the, the, uh, the project. That helps manage expectations. Step two, this is a fairly typical uh, governance model. You layer it like this, you have project execution, um, Let's see if this works at the bottom. Uh, and uh, you put project governance one step up. This allows you to separate the execution part from other issues that, encounter, that you encounter throughout the project. You may have escalations, you may have scope creep, or you will have scope creep. You will uh, have a number of different issues that you should try to get out of the project execution path right away and you deal with it at a governance level. And that's where the stakeholders meet, et cetera. And of course, at the top, this is where the executive sponsorship and uh, of course, from us, the vendor side, um, our account management uh, leadership sits as well. Pretty standard um, governance model. Step three, um, establish an agile model. Uh, so everybody has heard of Scrum, perhaps. Um, it's a great agile uh, methodology, uh, but it has some assumptions. It assumes that everybody who's involved in the project is a universal soldier, essentially. So given that the um, customer will have 
most of the time in these kinds of projects, the customer will have their team members participate as well. You're going to have people that are not universal soldiers. They may be good in certain things and not so good in others. And uh, you need to plan for that. So pure Scrum might not be um, suitable. Um, you got to ease into Agile. So you do that by accepting that everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Um, set the sprints, the iterations, at three weeks, not two weeks or one week. It gives you a little bit more time to do demos, etc. Uh, plan carefully, like I said before. Plan often, replan, prune your backlog, etc. You got to do that. You got to communicate these things um, within the team and with the customer all the time. Um, you should. Not share people. A lot of times you do you execute these projects uh, as a number of sub -pro projects that are all executing in parallel. It can be anywhere from three to fifteen parallel tracks, depending on the size of the project. Don't share people between these different sub projects. Uh, you can move people, but don't share them between. You're going to lack commit. You're going to lack uh, commitment to to um, uh, what you sign up for when you do that. Um, also identify an overall architect. It can come from the customer or it can be from us uh, and a, pr a program manager on that. One person who is in charge overall for architecture and a person who is in charge for the program. Okay, uh, in terms of organizing, uh, try to look at how you organize a project in three different layers. There's a business layer, a technical layer, and operational layer. And this allows you to do um, essentially two things. A lot of times people are just focused um, on the technology. But by focusing on the business layer and the workloads that you're going to run in your cloud, you can actually get the users engaged early. And of course, they don't have a cloud to run on. However, there are you know, solutions for that as well. Um, you can go to Rackspace, you can go to Marantz OpenStack Express, you can get the users familiar with how uh, OpenStack works. Uh, in fact, uh, um, on Mirantis Express, we, uh, uh, you can actually have a whole cloud and you can actually manage the cloud from hardware and up. It gives you a lot of really good experience on, on OpenStack early on in the project. Operations is all equally important. Uh, this is usually the biggest issue we have once the cloud is ready to start um, going into production. The operations team, uh, if they're not pulled in early, they're gonna be uh, having all kinds of issues in taking ownership of the cloud. So they should be there day one. They should be part of um, all the planning and they should be um, part of the development of the uh, logging monitoring operations tool, tools that they, they'll be using uh, once the cloud is up and running. All right. Oh, fine. I think this is finally. Uh, set up the interface model. So you're all oper operating in an in a, uh, agile model, but the rest of the organization is not. However, you can talk waterfall when you have to deal with other people. So just look at where you are in your sprints or in your iteration and see what the focus is. For example, it can be on the deployment side um, for a while. Well, then you are in the deployment layer in the waterfall. You can be doing testing. Well, you're doing testing. So when you talk to others, you talk about it in a waterfall way knowing that you're in a particular iteration, whatever. Very easy to actually translate between the two. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about execution now. Um, and I, I sort of liken that to uh, being handed the baby and you have to ship him or her off to college, right? Uh, uh, so in some sense, you're left holding the baby. Uh, the first thing that I would say is, well, you are now one team. Right? Um, the organizations that you go into, whether you're the vendor or you're on the, on the side of the customer who's, uh, who's hired the vendor, it all becomes one team. Right? Um, so when you do that, um, the first thing you do is clarify uh, and verify the team roles that uh, Rickard was talking about uh, that were, were, were then identified. So now, they may have changed, or um, the organization chart that you had uh, was formal, but there's always an informal organization chart. Uh, who's the go-to guy for program management? Who's the go-to guy for testing? Who's the go-to guy for architecture? They're not, sometimes it's not the chief architect, it's someone else, right? You have to get, you have to know those. Um, definitely, really find out. Uh, the next thing um, you'll find is when you have these big organizations, the ninjas, um, they are 
geographically dispersed. It, it's almost a given. I have, have had, um, and then you have the vendor, and they'll be ge geographically dispersed. So um, what you got to do is, you know, uh, make some uh, arrangements for that. Uh, just keep that in your mind. Um, they also, each of these teams that you have, they will have some interest that is uh, that is that needs the cloud, but is not exactly aligned with just deploying cloud. So, again, make a, make some arrangement for that. Keep that in the back of your mind, and they will have a different timeline than the cl cloud deployment. So they want something deployed by X, and you your you want something deployed by Y, and then th there will be tension between that, and you've got to negotiate that. So make sure you know that. Um, now, uh, <coughs> the big <coughs> excuse me the the biggest problem you'll you'll face um, is you know you know the technology you know what to do but coordination. Um, and it's coordination of not just, it's m not just people, certainly people, but also your, your systems, um, you know, your user stories, your uh, documentation, your processes. So make sure that you, are, you start with that. Right? Um, the other thing is uh, in modern management, uh, you know, everything is matrixed. Uh, the deployment team is where the rubber meets the road. There is one deployment team. Uh, however, the stakeholders are is hundreds, literally, um, and uh, you have and w guess what? You have some responsibility to the stakeholder. You just don't report to your management chain, but you also have responsibility, and that's the matrix. Right? And it's not it's not like the movie. It's not fun. Right? Um, so, so the, uh, then one thing you will notice is <coughs> Excel spreadsheets are uh, are not good coordination documentation mechanisms, right? There, you've got, uh, got to have online tools. Um, the only thing worse than Excel spreadsheets is emails. Right? Um, you shouldn't have to rely on, on, on your email system for coordination. Uh, <coughs> again, sorry. Um, so look at, look at all the stuff that you have there. You know, ticketing, user stories, source code control, unit tests, integration tests, so smoke tests, documentation, all of these, there are tools. And guess what? Um, your customer and the enterprise or, uh, and, the v and the vendor, they will invariably use different tools. So when you start the project, uh, you know, there's a lot of pushback uh, that someone's tool must be used. At least use one. Right? Start with one and apologize later. Uh, and in, and as, as the project goes on, your, um, your uh, tools will align. Uh, but You've got to make sure that you are using a ticketing system from day one. Otherwise, there's got to be a lot of pain. All right, so let's uh, look at some of the challenges and, I've, and some suggested solutions that we have. Um, the, uh, I wanted to use my, my French since we are in Paris. We have Boku stakeholders. We talked about that. Um, there's just make one source of truth, right? This is the ticketing system. And it's not enough just to make, hey, we're using Jira, right? Or we're using Bugzilla, whatever. Uh, but you have to make sure that nothing gets looked at unless it's already <coughs> in ticketing and that every single developer, if they even touch that problem, it, it's, it's reflected in the ticket. And that's, that is hard to do because developers want to develop, right? Um, and, uh, and then uh, there's a crisis and people want to, uh, want to know what's going on and they call you. So your answer should be look at the ticketing system. Believe me, that will save a lot of, lot of problems and people will appreciate uh, what you've done later on. The uh, <coughs> critical dip, uh, dip, uh, dependencies that you have, and this was in Rickard's uh, diagram, um, with the other teams, uh, you've got to make sure you have a connection with those teams, you know what their plans are and that you have a sponsor lined up on your side, either the champion of the project, or someone that you have a relationship with in that team. Right? Uh, otherwise, you're not gonna get deployed. Uh, if the network uh, engineering team doesn't give you the switches in time, the load balancing team doesn't give you the load balancer uh, stuff in time, you are, can't deploy. So it is critical. The um, don't do too much too soon, minimal what? <coughs> be, don't be ambitious about the MVP. Uh, demos, demonstrate stuff first, make small things work, take out the risk, and, and do this in phases. And then you have, you have an opportunity to replan every time. Right? 
and you can you can then see what your velocity is. Uh, uh, you you have a transformative change. You want to do everything all at once. Don't do it. That's not going to that that is going to cause a lot of pain. Um, expectation mismatch. I don't know if it's unique to the cloud, but it seems to be magnified by it because there's so many people who are interested in this uh, transformative uh, change. Uh, they are they they are expecting you to build different cloud. They think that they'll get stuff that you haven't promised or vice versa, you promise something that they don't want. Uh, so every time, every day, you, uh, my program manager job is that I am talking to some stakeholder, you know, clarifying what we're going to be delivering and, and making course changes if there are differences. Yeah. All right. Uh, this probably is unique to the cloud. Um, you know, we use whatever it's uh, Tempest or, you know, other tests that are they're in the community, but they tune for different things, right? Um, what you got to tune the cloud for, and there's multiple ways you can tune the cloud. Everybody, you know, there's, if, a, if someone like, uh, is storage heavy or network heavy, there's the, you, you tune it differently. So use the real test cases that belong to the users of the cloud, not from the team, right? They, so because eventually the users are the ones who are going to say, um, oh, uh, this is good or this is bad, right? Um, Understanding is, is a problem. Uh, everybody has a different definition for cloud, everybody, uh, and not everybody's heard of OpenStack. It, that might come as a surprise to you, but uh, not everybody knows what Solometer is, right? Um, so you've got to get that. Uh, and then also about Agile, all of these things, you should make sure that there is some common understanding and you fill the gaps with training or uh, mentoring. Right? Uh, opaque planning, and this has got to do with um, the cloud is seen as a transformative IT, you know, uh, or business uh, uh, technology or movement, um, and uh, uh, the, the 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 entire enterprise is involved, not just a, a small department in in doing that kind of transformation. So they there are people who are who are making plans for that transformation, and they're not they may not be talking to your team. Uh, if they're not go talk to them, uh, find out what they're going to do, um, and, and, and absolutely be involved in the planning. You know, be, be in that circle of planning that they are, uh, they're doing. Um, then the last one is, you know, uh, lots of jobs cha chasing OpenStack engineers, right? So um, do not rely on that one person who knows Neutron or, um, or knows, uh, you know, how to tune your, your cloud. Always make sure you, you have multiple people uh, and expect churn, right, so, and, and plan for it. <laughs> so um, those are some of the suggestions. And uh, Christian, over to you. Okay, so management has decided you want, they want uh, cloud. The manager comes, oh yeah, good. The manager comes to your office and says, well, we are going to get into the cloud space. And first of all, of course, there's uh, many ways to skin a cloud, skin a cat. And so you're sort of left in the cold. Usually you only get a very small chunk of uh, information that you are uh, going to have to work with. And then finally you get told by the, by the same manager, oh, and by the way, we've hired this company to ins install the cloud for you. So this is what we oftentimes get seen as, guy who comes in, pokes people with a sharp instrument and makes it, takes it over, takes your job over, makes you look bad to management because you uh, are not doing in the eyes of man management are not doing the job. And that's not at all how it is. In reality, we have the challenges. Of course, you can do it by yourselves. OpenStack is open. You can download it. You can install it. You can configure it. If you have ever tried to do that manually, you'll find out it's not, it's not fun. And it usually does not lead to what you want it to lead to. So to ease the pain of doing that, you can use deployment tools, uh, they will take away some of the problems that you will experience. But even more so, if you don't have somebody who has already made those mistakes and has seen other companies make those mistakes, you're going to run into those problems anyway. Even the uh, deployment tool is not going to help you with that. 
Second thing is um, we come in and first of all we sit down, we have a stack of paperwork and we are uh, talking to you about this and that and your infrastructure and your team and um, skill sets and uh, anything that you can imagine of architectural assessment. And of course, yes, it's boring. Yes, sometimes these meetings seem like they are leading nowhere, but we have the best practices that have we have developed in a long time of actually doing this in the field we, with people, with uh, other companies that are seeing the same problems that you have. And then the better we understand your uh, infrastructure, yeah, but the better we understand the business problems that you face, the users that you are working with, the better we can help you build a cloud that uh, matches the expectations of management, of the users, and of yourself, of course. And then finally, you, uh, yes, I've, I used to, do, to think the same way when I was um, working at a company. Uh, somebody from a vendor came in. Yes, I can do that by myself, but uh, we rely on you being able to do your job. I mean, you wouldn't be here in this room if you weren't good at what you are doing. Uh, people management doesn't send you here to if, uh, if you are not actually uh, among the top people in your company to do that. And what we really are doing or what we really expect and hope for every time we go into your, the company and every time we uh, look into the set of faces that's sitting in that boardroom is that we will have a team, people who are all skilled at their jobs and doing what they, do, what they do best. A few things that we encounter every time or in many times that we are uh, doing cloud projects. First of all, preparation. You, your management signed a statement of work with us. There's something relatively opaque in there that says, okay, we will build a cloud for this purpose and this is what, we, what roughly is going to happen. But the, the real decision of uh, what needs to be done is done together with you, and this is in the preparation phase. Oftentimes, you know, between the statement of work and the actual execution, there's a few weeks and uh, you think, okay, I should be filling in this piece of paper that they sent me, or I should be uh, working on this. But in reality, people, Somebody, the user comes in, I want this. Somebody comes in, I want that. And in the end, the day sneaks up on you. Wow, they're here, coming in. So taking a little bit of time and taking uh, the effort to do prep work, specifically prep work in terms of how do we work, uh, how are we going to work with these people, how are we going to give them access to our environment, are they going to be on uh, online or are they going, going to be on-site here working with us. Communication with us, if you have questions, say so right away. The better, the earlier, the better. And then finally, procrastination. Everyone has done it. If somebody says, I've never procrastinated in my life, I'm pretty sure that they're lying. But uh, in this case, it makes sense to uh, keep that at least to a minimum. Accept change. Yes, cloud is entirely different from a, f uh, from a classic data center infrastructure. For instance, you have uh, servers, you have traditional storage, you have traditional networking. And a lot of this is now, instead of logging into a router, making the iOS changes and saving them, you have some software that does something similar, but different, and you have to adapt to that. But on the plus side, you are going to be the elite in this field. This is going to be bigger and bigger over the years, and you are the people who are on the front line of this, and uh, you are making yourself more valuable, and you are making your company and us more valuable if you are uh, adapting to what we are doing well. And finally, this is a team sport. We, uh, everyone sees, you know, this is my group, this is the other group. There's little fights, little tussles. But in reality, the better everyone works together, the better people communicate, the better people are, uh, see each other as co-workers, as teammates, playing towards the same goal, the easier it is for every one of us. Now, patterns to adapt. This is things, these are things that we find useful when we are doing a cloud deployment. First of all, best practices. 
everyone talks about them. It's one of the buzzwords. Well, I have those best practices. I'm, uh, I'm using them. But uh, we have a few things that we tell people to do, and that they uh, all come from long experience of not doing them and failing on or exper experiencing failures and difficulties because we have not been doing them. Usually, it's cheaper to learn from the mistakes of others than to make the mistakes yourself, become the guinea pig, and making it, you know, you, do, you don't want to chew on a chew on a leaf of lettuce. Let, let, let the other guy chew on the leaf of lettuce and, not, uh, and find out whether it's really tasty. Recycle within reason. This is another thing that I've personally come across a few times uh, lately, specifically companies that have that set aside something specific for a specific project. And I have to tell them, this is unfortunately not going to provide you with the performance or the reliability that you need for this specific project. If I say so, I'm not doing that because I want to sell you something. We don't sell hardware. We don't sell any kind of uh, infrastructure. If I, I also don't have personal reasons. I don't like new and shiny any better than I like something that's uh, cl classic and proven. But uh, if I come to the conclusion through calculation and through experience that uh, this is not going to work or that we will have to augment this with some new purchase, then I'm saying that because I want to advance the project and uh, improve the, the experience that you have from that. And finally, and this is um, a trap that I have fallen into myself quite a few times, favor stability. Don't think that you need the newest version of OpenStack to, become, to be happy. If I deploy uh, Juno OpenStack right now in a production environment, I'm probably not going to be very happy about it, and neither are you. So having tried and true is good. Every once in a while, you come across a problem where you really need a specific version. And in some cases, it really makes sense to go to that newest version and experience the pain because there is a way, there is no way around the uh, version that of a specific item that you that you need for uh, for something. But normally, I would re recommend do not upgrade every six months and do not get the newest version uh, of the get-go. I would, for instance, deploy Icehouse right now and uh, then in a year upgrade to whatever is uh, the, the, the experience or the, the stable version at that point. And one thing that you certainly want to avoid, I at least want to avoid it, is this. Expensive downtimes and sleepless nights. And I've had uh, enough of uh, both to, to know that I don't want them. If you keep to all that, you are going to have happy cloud users, and this is exactly what we are here about. Finally, this is the bad part. Certain things need to be avoided, and one of them, the most important of them actually, is shooting from the hip. Um, yeah, I'm going to make that change here. I know how to do it. I can make it reliably, although something might go wrong. But what, do, what does the poor guy do who got, gets woken up uh, six weeks down the road at night to troubleshoot the problem that my change inadvertently caused? He doesn't know anything. He doesn't have documentation. He's going to sit there for six hours and swear at me. Maybe he doesn't know that it's me, but uh, I don't want to live by that. I don't want to uh, be the one who just was lucky enough not to be discovered to make a, make a bad change. So. Even if you're not empl uh, employing CI/CD, I would recommend to at least find a certain modicum of control over your change process. Otherwise, you are going to be uh, in for the sad sleepless nights and uh, unhappy users. Second thing is losing direction. Uh, Anandeep and Rickard were both co uh, talking about the minimum viable product. And the minimum viable product is very important because in this case, uh, we, are, we are working towards a common goal. And if not everyone is aware of what that common goal is and we have this defined minimum viable product, then people are going to diverge and then you are going to get this zigzag uh, towards the goal that uh, takes uh, extra hours, extra effort, extra money, and unhappy management. And finally, 
And this is another thing that I've seen all too many times, and not only in small uh, small companies, or not not even predominantly in small companies, because small companies have this way they have a, a guru hacker oftentimes who uh, knows how to get how to get keep that running more or less. Uh, I've seen that in great in big companies. Uh, I mean, Fortune 500 companies experimenting in production. They have a test environment, they have a dev environment, and they still make a change in production just to see whether it will work. And then figure out, oops, it didn't. What do you do then? And this, yeah, most nothing is more expensive than unhappy cloud users. You lose customers, you, you lose uh, revenue, and uh, people are uh, going to be unhappy, and this is, uh, you lose reputation, and this is the important point. So, and this is what we are all about. Together we will build, build awesome clouds. You can't do it alone, I can't do it alone, but all of us can. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think we have time for questions. Do you want to use the microphone? Or the uh, you talked uh, uh, quite a bit about minimum viable product. As you, as you talk to ranges of companies, is there a prototypical minimum viable product that lots of people could deploy? Yeah. Uh, actually, we could do this. Yeah. Okay, we'll start here. Yes. Uh, I'm Hello. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah, so um, the uh, that's a really good question. I think it, in general, uh, you always want to start with infrastructure as a service. And you may add a few items to that. For example, some other network functions such as load balancer, firewall. Um, some companies will war look at the business layer and they want to be able to enable certain workloads um, at the push of a button. So you will, um, that gives you a kind of a template of the first minimum viable product. But there's usually a minimum viable or an MVP for each major milestone, so it evolves. But you start with your basic service. I should be able to get a server. I should be able to create a little virtual private network. I should be able to deploy a load balancer. That's kind of where, where it starts usually. Other questions? Hello, I'm very interested in the MVP approach and I uh, was looking for uh, information about tools, tools that are um, uh, useful in order to, to try to make the MVP approach. I don't really find them. Like free mind, mind mapping first, all of the tools on the MVP approach. So uh, the uh, the tools that we have in place, like uh, uh, user story tools, like Rally is one. Um, you can uh, uh, you can you can you can look at an MVP from the user's perspective and say these 15 user stories have to be enabled. So there doesn't have to be you know what you're doing with the MVP is defining scope, uh, not so much uh, your that. You, you know, there's, uh, at the end of the day, that's the, what you're delivering. But the tools for delivery do exist, and I believe we've been successfully re reusing, like uh, ticketing, we use Jira, for example, um, Rally, and, and for deployment, we use uh, the ticketing system, and for user stories, you know, it on, so to rephrase that, for infrastructure, we use the ticketing system, and for, uh, for uh, the business, uh, use, use cases, we use the user stories, and those have worked successfully. That's not to say that there aren't other tools. I would say PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, well, yeah, that's I think communication. Uh, yeah. Elsewhere on the internet, you have a website or some, somewhere where MVP can be uh, very explained or detailed, and we should have uh, your experience and other experience about MVP. I, uh, I saw someone which is uh, uh, Eric Ries or something like Eric that in uh, 211, uh, and had some experiments on that. And he says MVP sometimes can't work. Uh, you have some, it was for a website, I, I saw the six. So uh, we need uh, to improve, I think, MVP or find where is the experience about MVP. I, I, I do think that's, that's correct, yes. And we are in the early stages, right? So Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, All right, he got first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's maybe more a remark than a question. Uh, this is about how to build uh, the cloud. But I think uh, then the challenge will start to, to maintain it. Uh, for example, you didn't uh, explain about 
to give a predictable roadmap for, for our company to, to use the cloud, when to go to next generation of the product. Uh, yeah, maybe, so maybe you can, can tell a little bit about that. So uh, definitely, uh, uh, Rickard did touch upon it on the operations. Uh, if you uh, we can see if we can uh, get back to that. Yeah, we, we, told, we said that it was very yeah, important, but we didn't get into yeah, um, we didn't uh, get what to do yeah. about it necessarily. But it is a day one problem that has to be, be addressed. And you need to have, have um, team members from the operational side involved, especially you know, in, in these more complex projects where a lot of time operations is provided by the customer themselves. So you gotta have uh, people involved with this already. You gotta look at logging, monitoring, and metering primarily. Those are three things. And um, uh, yep. it's, yeah, it's a, it's a cultural change a lot as well. A lot of it is. But, um, and then tools, automation, et cetera, becomes uh, part. Of and one, one more thing, that a trend that will soon start to emerge is managed services, where um, the, uh, the vendors uh, will now be asked to run the cloud uh, on behalf of the customer. Uh, and then there's a whole set of tooling that you have to do. You have to set up processes. We do have that. Um, it was not in scope in this talk, but uh, thank you for the suggestion. We'll, we'll definitely, maybe next, uh, next summit, we'll address that. Excuse me. In one of the slides, here, here. Oh, OK, yeah, all right. In one of the slides, we have seen a term, CICD. Yes. What does that stand for? Uh, that is continuous integration, continuous development. So, Thank uh, you very much. The, the idea behind CICD is uh, that instead of making changes manually and implementing changes manually, is that you have a, a defined process to do that and to use tools to do that, uh, specifically tools like uh, Garrett for uh, code mm -hmm. review and... Uh, um, Jenkins? Thank Jenkins, <laughs> yeah. <maybe>. Th <laughs> thank you. Yeah. It's been a long day. Yeah. Uh, so, and Jen Jenkins for the actual implementation. Uh, these tools have the advantage that if you use those uh, in a controlled fashion, then you will have a lot less of a risk of somebody who is manually doing something, making a mistake, uh, and also have a, a backlog to see wh who did what at what time, so you can determine this is where the problem was introduced, and this is how we are going to resolve that next time. And, and this is part of Agile as well. Um, you have to have an Agile model to really get the full benefit of a continuous CICD. So what's your recommendations around sort of um, versions versus stability? You made the point that you know, customers want to sell an ice house now. Uh, it's a stable product. We've heard this in the summit about rolling upgrades being a key one for some enterprises. What are your so thoughts around that? So uh, I, I'll, I'll let Christian address some of those. Uh, as a program manager, um, uh, the decisions you have to make are, are the following, right? One is features. Right? Um, which features uh, does the customer need? Uh, and where, have the, uh, where are they fullest and uh, versus stability, right? Uh, so you you got to make that decision um, based on what the customer needs. Uh, the second one is um, is about um, then you might have to make a decision about well is there a way to we can backport these features where we take advantage of whatever stability we have for this current version that the customer is using um, versus you know going to a completely new one. Uh, the third one is uh, upgrades. Uh, upgrades uh, are. Uh, are definitely a big priority for, for our customers. M a lot of the customers know that OpenStack is evolving and have some plan based on that, but if they don't, you have to let the customer know that, uh, that in-place upgrades that they are used to in regular data centers don't happen yet with OpenStack. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but those are some of the concerns that we address. Right, so there's... Uh no real rule of thumb of how to do that. Uh, what I would uh, suggest uh, is first of all, looking at an existing version, let's say we're looking at Ice House, and see whether the feature set matches what you need out of it. Uh, Backporting features has its advantages in some cases. The problem with that is that you are getting something that is support-wise more difficult to manage than uh, straight release. If, uh, if you have a straight release and you talk to our 
technical support, they can tell you, okay, this is a known bug, this is not a known bug, um, we need to file a bug about this, this is something that uh, we have, we can fix, this is a configuration problem. If you have something where you uh, backport, for instance, a newer version of Keystone or something like that, then it's a lot more difficult because then they have to go back, our people have to go back and look at uh, the uh, infrastructure and see whether they can replicate the problem somehow. So a backporting I would only do if there is a good reason to have, if you have a, a feature set that largely matches your expectations and you only have this one piece that has to be different. So uh, about versions, I would def definitely not use the version that is leading up to an, an OpenStack Summit, that like everything has been Juno right now, I would um, at least not at the beginning of the cycle, because uh, there are still so many bugs being found and you are not the one, you, you should not be the one who wants to find all those bugs. I mean, if you really are into, into uh, bug chasing, certainly it's a good idea, but uh, in general, I would, for instance, use uh, the summit but the Kilo Summit, everything uh, leading up to it has been Juno. Now that is probably the time where Juno is uh, gaining the stability where you, where you might want to implement it. And in, in the end, the other thing that I suggest is talking to op other OpenStack users, visiting forums, reading blog articles, because you can glean a lot of the stability problems for or stability status that you are talking about in a specific release by seeing what other people experience that are using the same release. Do we have time for one more question? One maybe? More, okay. Problem. Any other questions? Okay, one more. So did you, did you ever have to say no to a customer, be it because uh, the customer might be too small or because... Every day. The case doesn't suit. Like, yeah. could you elaborate we, on the case? Every day, <laughs> every I can, day. <laughs> I can give you a concrete example. I'm not <laughs> going to name the customer, but I, uh, uh, a short while ago, I wrote an architectural review that uh, concluded with uh, we should not engage in this uh, specific case. The reasoning behind it was we had the customer had specific performance and reliability. Uh, goals and, and uh, parameters that they had to be working within, and they did not have or did they simply did not want to commit the necessary resources to reach those. The resource set was so short that I, have, from, from my experience, I had to say, sorry, this is not going to work, and we do not want to be, or we, we cannot be part of this because this is going to lead to something that is not going to be sustainable. No, it's it, was, it, was, uh, it was money for infrastructure in this case. I think they, um, I know which case you talk about, but there, there are sometimes um, misalignments between what they ambition to do with hardware. Well, there are vendors who want to put the hardware solution together and they may want to run a particular uh, kind of OpenStack configuration or um, components of OpenStack on it. And when we come in and we look at that architecturally, we find out that um, the performance objectives of that solution will not be met. So if the customer is not willing to change um, to the recommendation we have, it's not much we can do, you know, so, yeah. So, so in, and when you're within a project from the project execution framework, uh, there is always pressure uh, for adding another a new feature or, or enabling another user. Uh, and if you have done a plan before and you know that that's risky, uh, and it can't be met, then you can't commit to it, right? Um, and you have to say no at that point. That doesn't mean that you don't use your ingenuity to try and find a solution, but it, it definitely means that y if you want to deploy something that is uh, meets the MVP, then you can't have additional features uh, at the last moment. But this is also why... I'm sorry. Sorry. Also, this is not a flat no in the sense of, um, okay, the, I don't, the customer doesn't want to do what I want to do, uh, this is a no that says, okay, this is what I see as the minimum that uh, you will, will have to have to get your stability and performance goals. And uh, so can we, can we make a, a deal there? Can we fix that? And this so is probably what Rickard was going to say. No, I was just going to say that um, by trying to always focus on the business objectives first, usually there are other solutions. A lot of times um, even the customer tends to focus on the technology too much. 
there are many ways to skin a cat, as uh, Chris, Christian said originally. So. All right, I think uh, we're out of time, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you very much. Good questions.